So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the development of a tradition known as Catholic social teaching. Um, and it's a tradition that in one sense began in 1891 with the publication of a social letter, a social encyclical written by Pope Leo XIII um, to the Catholic Church globally. Um, and that letter was called Rerum Novarum, which means on new things. And it was the first time that the papacy had written a letter on what it called the social question. And it's quite significant, I'll perhaps come back to this in a minute, that it was described as the social question rather than, say, the political question or the economic question. Now, in reality, very much of that letter is taken up with economic questions. It's taken up with the question of living wages, as we've now come to call them, um, of the relationship between labour and capital, of a question about the nature and function of human government from a theological point of view, questions about the organisation of workers, uh, trade union membership and so forth, and on the family, and questions about how the family was being changed by the reality of industrialisation. So although the bulk of the letter is concerned with economic issues, the framing of it is that this is the church writing on a range of social issues. So this first letter um, is written in 1891, and since then, the popes have each, each subsequent pope um, has written uh, at least one, some have written more than one, uh, social letter, which attempts to, in biblical terms, read the signs of the times, so look at the prevailing social, political, economic, and more recently ecological context um, uh, of human life, and to offer a doctrinal and pastoral take on those challenges and those issues. Now, the tradition that Catholic social teaching draws on theologically obviously did not begin in 1891. So this is why I'm saying in one sense, it's true to say that Catholic social teaching begins in 1891 with the promulgation of this very conscious, deliberate letter, which aims to bring together theological reflection with social, political and economic analysis. But the tradition theologically that's being drawn on goes back to the scriptures. Um, goes back to the early church, goes back to um, uh, trends and developments, particularly in medieval theology as well as patristic theology. So the tradition itself can be seen as in continuity with um, the entire whole of the Christian church's attempt to meditate in a deep and profound way on social, political, economic and environmental questions, but it develops this new lease of life. So I think it's worth asking why the church decides that it needs to write such a letter in 1891. What is it about the circumstances at that point that means that a new tradition is given birth to? Because when something new happens in the church, it's usually worth paying attention to the context that produces that. Very often when something new happens in the church, it's because there's a situation of conflict or difficulty that gives birth to something new. And in this sense, Catholic social teaching is no different. So the papacy um, had uh, seen a period of very significant upheaval. Um, it had lost a lot of its land. It had lost lots of its own political power. And there was a sense that the church was understanding that the political landscape of the West was changing dramatically, um, as was the economic landscape. And so I think Catholic social teaching born at this point um, in the 19th century was an attempt to galvanise the church to engage constructively and positively with a reality that it was finding bewildering. And I think it was finding that reality bewildering for a number of reasons. One, because the way in which it had configured itself politically was no longer working. Secondly, because there had been a rise of a series of new theories about what it meant to be human, that the church was finding indigestible, that it was finding it couldn't easily match or correlate with its own tradition of what we might call theological anthropology, theological reflection on the question of what it means to be human. So I think although people often associate Catholic social teaching and the letters that each of the popes has produced um, as simply a body of teaching on economics and politics, more significantly, it should be read as political theological anthropology. It's an attempt to say that the basic narrative, the basic storyline of socialism, communism, of liberalism, were, and of capitalism, were at odds with a Christian anthropology. So it's an attempt to re-narrate what it means to be human in the light of the material conditions happening around us at the time that the letters are written, and in the context of a long Christian doctrine, a contested Christian doctrine, but a long Christian doctrine of reflection on the nature of the relationship um, of humanity to the creator, of creature-creator relations. 
So I think understanding that Catholic social teaching is born in a particular political moment, a particular economic moment, but that also at the heart of it is a doctrinal struggle with the anthropologies of the modern age is a really critical starting point if you're trying to get hold of the kind of beast that Catholic social teaching is. So I've mentioned Rerum Novarum as the um, uh, originating letter of the modern tradition, and I've mentioned that it was centrally concerned with the impact of changes around the Industrial Revolution, of the fact that an industrial capitalist model was structuring the way in which human beings uh, related to each other, developed communities, and that this was deeply interconnected with political developments um, of the time as well, that there was a symbiotic relationship for the church between economic and political shifts. So it's worth highlighting perhaps some of the um, suggestions um, uh, that Catholic social teaching makes for the way that we should think about economic life. Now, when the Catholic Church makes these suggestions, it's drawing on, as I said before, a really long tradition um, of Christian thinking um, about human government, about politics, but also about economics. And often it's forgotten that there is a long Christian tradition of thinking about economics, um, as well as about um, politics uh, and social life. So the medieval tradition of thinking about just prices, what was a just price to charge, becomes in the context of, it, of um, the Industrial Revolution and the development of capitalism, questions about living wages. Now, the basis of uh, the structure of Catholic social teaching on economic life is connected very much with an argument that because of the dignity of the human person, there is always a priority of labour over capital. But that the fundamental problem with a capitalist model is that it tends to always try to put capital over labour. So that there's a form of uh, tension and even enslavement um, of labour to capital. So the teaching of Rerum Novarum is that there is always a priority of labour over capital, that the market is meant to serve the person, not the person the market, just as the state is meant to serve the person and not the person the state. The same uh, principles would apply. So insisting on the priority of labour over capital has a series of implications for the way that the market would run. So first of all, living wages. Um, the living wage tradition in the Catholic Church is not concerned simply with a minimum standard for survival, but rather a living wage is seen as a wage that allows you to meet your material needs for food, um, for housing, um, for basic family life, but also crucially for leisure and participation, social participation. Now that might mean, as the later tradition goes on to point out, that um, the living wage you need for living in London may well be different from a living wage that you need to live in Carlisle. It may be that there's a living wage that you need to live in Nairobi that's very different from a living wage in New York. And the criteria for setting those understandings of the living wage are very much around questions um, not just of immediate survival, but also of the possibility of engaging in education, self-education, um, of, of leisure time, um, of Sabbath rest, um, and also um, of social participation um, so that you're enabled to do that. So that tradition of thinking about a living wage has been also quite politically significant in the last sort of 15 years or so. It's inspired, uh, for example, um, various of the trade union and um, also um, community organising groups like Citizens UK to engage with renewed vigour um, in the fight for living wages, which has had some really interesting effects um, in this region in the northeast at the moment. Um, we've got quite a focus on uh, living wage um, employers because we're the lowest um, wage um, part of the UK at the moment. So living wages, the priority of labour over capital, the importance of workers organising to achieve the common good. So the idea that a labourer in the face of capital would be able to negotiate their own interests uh, is seen as being politically naive. And the reality is that in order to um, defend the interests of labour, it's necessary for labour to organise. Now, um, there's a bit of a, a debate with the trade union. Sometimes the trade unions will say, Catholic social teaching says you've got to join a trade union. It's your duty to join a trade union. Um, Catholic social teaching says it's your duty to organise um, for your own interest. Um, uh, and that, that trade unions are one way in which you can organise um, to uh, defend your own interests, to advocate for your own interests um, as labour. 
However, um, there are other possibilities as well. Joining a trade union does not exhaust that process, um, and that relies on trade unions also themselves being ethical bodies um, who act in such a way that they're broadly defending uh, the goods and the interests um, of labour. So um, they're kind of right, the trade unions, when they say Catholic social teaching says you've got to join a union, but on the other hand, there are some things that Catholic social teaching would want to say back to the unions um, and would also want to say about um, plural ways in which labour can be organised. So that's a little bit about the content of Rerum Novarum itself and its economic direction. Catholic social teaching also um, talks about the nature of politics. Now, one of the really interesting things, if you're um, a kind of theological nerd about um, uh, Christian political thought, as sadly I am, is that Catholic social teaching is what we would refer to as a prelapsarian um, political theology. So basic tension between uh, more Augustinian and more Thomist understandings of the nature of politics, and there's a debate about where Augustine's placed in all of this, but nonetheless, um, there are generally post-lapsarian and then more pre-lapsarian accounts of the grounds of politics. A pre-lapsarian account of politics says, even if there'd been no fall, even if there had been no eating of forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, we were created in our goodness as political beings. We would still have had to have negotiated our life together to negotiate the goods um, that we live with, to decide on the allocation of what we have um, and to use ways of living together as an orientation towards um, achieving a final good. So there would have been a sense in which politics would already have been part of God's idea for the good creation. For post-lapsarian political thinkers, politics is solely the consequence of the fall. Politics is a consequence of sin. And so the primary character of politics is about the restraint of evil. So structures exist in order to force us, if necessary, but hopefully simply encourage us and exhort us um, towards acting um, for the common good um, and restraining evil. So Catholic social teaching sits on the pre-lapsarian side of that account. So in other words, um, it holds on to the idea that participation in politics and the political itself, although it absolutely is, uh, exists in relation to the fall, to sin, um, to the fact that there are um, uh, deeply problematic aspects to the world, still there is something about politics that expresses the nature of our vocation towards virtue and the good that is part of that original plan for God's creatures. So it is, to my mind, interesting, partly because it is a prelapsarian political theology. It insists on the inherent goodness of politics, that politics is one of the highest vocations um, uh, that somebody could enter, um, and that the state itself is therefore not only to enact law or even to see law as simply the restraint on evil, a break on evil, but law and political government is there in order to actively foster political goods. Now that doesn't mean to do for others um, or even to do to others, but rather that there should be ways in which government itself acts as a structure of virtue as well as restraining in the context of structures of sin. So I think that context for thinking about the way Catholic social teaching sees politics is particularly interesting and that can lead to very interesting conversations about uh, whether we share um, a more pre-lapsarian or, or post-lapsarian view of politics. Now, the view of the state that Catholic social teaching has is therefore also interesting. It's a correlate. It follows on from that broader um, Thomist um, political theology. So the view of government is that it is there in order to enact and protect the good and to restrain evil, but that the state must not do for others what um, others can do, what we can do for ourselves. So the state is not the source of all solidarity. The state cannot act, enact all forms of charity and welfare. The state exists as a structure which ought in essence to enable others to achieve and reach and associate for their own good. So within the configuration of Catholic social teaching, there are a number of key principles. I'll come back to a couple of them um, in a minute. But one of the key um, principles for thinking about politics alongside the common good is the principle of subsidiarity. Now, the principle of subsidiarity was, was murdered, was slaughtered um, on the altar of the European Union um, and its highly bureaucratic language um, and needs rescuing and retrieving because subsidiarity as a principle in Catholic social teaching is about keeping power at a level where it remains close to people um, who are going to be affected by decisions that are made. 
So there's a slight misreading of subsidiarity as simply being an invocation of um, localism. Um, and a scepticism about any form of, um, of power beyond the local. In fact, that's actually not true. What Catholic social teaching says is that, in general, it will be true that the closer you make a decision to the lives of those who are affected, that enables their participation in decision-making that affects them, the more just the outcome is likely to be. If we think in everyday terms, when decisions are taken on behalf of people that don't involve consulting them, um, very often we lose the expertise of real practice and real experience. And that doesn't help for good politics or good government, nor does it make for good uh, models of um, economic justice. So in one sense, it's a common sense point that power, um, the further away it is from the people whose lives are affected, tends to distort. But the, the principle of subsidiarity is in fact about discerning the level at which people...